Take one example of one of these recent disasters that you feel like the response effort was not as efficient or as effective, and just kind of talk about that. I mean, I, I think every every response faces uh, has its own challenges and its own face of challenges. Uh, when you work international, uh, the first challenge is that you're working with a foreign government. Uh, they must invite you in. Um, you must, uh, and, you, and, and so in that case, trying to figure out how do you work with that government? What rules do you fall under? Uh, are you, for example, in Haiti, we're working debris management. Well, we have our own set of EPA environmental rules and legislation laws that we have to follow. Uh, do you overlay United States law on top of a country? Or, or their laws. What, what if they don't have those laws in place? What's my responsibility as a steward of this of uh, one of our our uh, government and our our assets, but also steward of just the environment? So we have to balance that. So that's always a challenge. Uh, I, I would say in Haiti, uh, that challenge uh, was manifested in that uh, the Port-au-Prince area was destroyed, and so much most of your government, your physical government facilities were destroyed, and a lot of the infrastructure, not only the physical infrastructure, but the governance infrastructure was destroyed, and so that presented a problem. Um, you know, that, and that's highlighted by it, it is an island, and so you have limited points of entry. You have ports, both air and sea. Uh, but those were also damaged. So I, I think, while I would say it's, it was not a, a failure, mm -hmm. but it is, it is an area that we have to work at, and is how do you quickly gain access to an impacted area, uh, working with that government, being invited in, uh, in an area which has damaged infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of, uh, I, I know that you've mentioned some pre-planning. Maybe this is not exactly what you had in mind, but could you think about, in a pre-planning type of activities mm -hmm. that you could have done, or not you personally, but that could have been done in the humanitarian response community, that would help mitigate those kind of challenges? Uh, well, I think the area that we have to work on is we're good at fighting the last response. And so we will probably look at Haiti and then over the next six to 18 months work diligently, dil dil diligently in the Caribbean area and in, in, in South America. Uh, or we'll focus hard on uh, earthquakes and response to earthquakes, mm -hmm. and so we, I think we have to be be careful not to fall in that trap and look holistically. And so I, I think the area that we have to work is, is our partnerships, our networks. Um, and one of my bosses told me, you know, you know uh, Frank, you need to make friends before you need a friend. So our job is to make friends early mm -hmm. and make friends often. And how do you do that? Well, you network, and it's all about the people. Uh, and so you have to go out in these different regions of the world, assess the environment in which they live in, assess the environments that may be impacted by natural or man-made disasters, and then build those networks early on. And so I think that's an area we have to work is building networks and friendships across the international community, across NGOs that are non-government organizations, and across our, our government organizations. And often there's barriers in there, uh, both physical barriers uh, from computer, physical computer barriers, to just... Um, Barriers in in terms of uh, uh, our relationships or um, yeah, our, our you know culture. Mm -hmm. So in terms of Haiti, I mean, I know that there are a lot of logistical challenges, especially mm -hmm. in the very beginning. As you said, it's an island, and most of the points of entry is were destroyed. Uh, can you think of any, or do you have in mind any pre-planning type of activities or you know long-term activities that could have been done? Uh, to ease those logistical challenges that happen in the very beginning? Um, that, that's a tough one uh, in terms of pre-planning. Uh, again, I, I, I think we, we can't... And not necessarily just your organization, yeah, right. but in general, the whole community. In, in, the, in, the, in the international community, I don't, I don't think you can plan for every event. Um, it's, it's just too tough. There's too many countries, too many hazards out there. But, but what you have to have is a, is a general construct that you're willing to work under. Uh, you know, some of the challenges early on in Haiti, who was in charge? What's well, the Haitian government? Uh, but who's in charge of the response? And so coordinating amongst uh, the, respond the first responders from all these nations. And so I think the area we have to work hard on is, is a construct where the international community can quickly come together in support of a nation and, and get over some of the biases and some of, of the cultural differences, uh, and, and in some cases the egos that come with, with different cultures and, and different countries and, and different organizations. And so I think that's an area we have to work is, is building. I go back to the networking and partnership. We've we got to have these in place before the event happens. Uh, would that have helped in Haiti? Yes. Uh, 
did we did we have a specific Haitian plan? We as the international community to support Haiti for an earthquake? No. Uh, again, just too tough to do. Uh, but we do have to build on networks and relationships and partnerships prior to the event. I think that's one area that the international community at large has to work on. And, and it's not just, it doesn't fall on the backs of one country, it doesn't fall on the backs of one international organization like the UN, uh, but it has to be regional organizations and bottom-up organizations and non-governmental organizations that come together uh, and that builds this framework and this, this fabric mm -hmm. of response and recovery. And, and, and all of us have a piece, a thread of this fabric. We've got to weave this fabric together so that when we do respond, it's a complete blanket of support. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's an area I think we have to work hard in. Mm -hmm. Were you the ones who actually rebuilt the airport in the first 48 hours so that's operational? Uh, the, the U.S. government yes. had, had a large part of it, uh, the Air Force specifically, in support of Southcom uh, getting the airport. But again, uh, as you look at the airport, who owns the airport? The government of Haiti does. Uh, and so you have to go in and start asking permissions. How do you maintain mm -hmm. or execute airport operations safely to land all the, uh, the humanitarian assistance that's coming in? Is that a U.S. lead? Is that a, a French lead? Is that a Haitian lead? Uh, who decides? And, and, and that's that kind of that, that friction early on in trying to figure out because it's, it's a big safety issue. And, and then also whose rules and regulations we fall under. And luckily, most airports are following the international governments in terms of this, you know, there's, there's international norms for, for an airfield operation. And of course, I mean, uh, I know that, I mean, everybody kind of knew that the U.S. government went and helped to make it operational. Yes. And then also, I think it, it also came in and kind of did allocating of space and yes. landing and so on, so that everybody could start landing. But at, on the other hand, in the international press, press there were a lot of reports there, in terms of, there you was. know, you didn't let this plane land and that plane land yes. and all that. So which is, I mean, it's just and, and that goes to show that like what you're saying yeah. is so correct. Yeah. And that goes to that, that that building that networking of partnership. Now, you know, Haiti is in our backyard. It is part of the Americas. And so we would hope that America would take a, a you know a, a strong lead there. Uh, as we look around the world and as you respond as a government, there are certain areas that you want to respond uh, and monetarily because that, that's the best fit. Uh, but when the event is in your backyard and it's part of the Americas, you want to make sure that America, as one of the countries in this in this hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, provides uh, that support. And, and the face of America is down there. But it is a challenge, you know, because. You're working with a government that, that's, that has been destroyed physically in terms of its, its infrastructure uh, and it's trying to rebuild and, and gain some semblance of governance. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have lots of governments coming to them, we're here to help, we're here to help. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, they, they want to take a tactical pause and just say, stop, let us catch our breath, figure out who's alive, who's, mm -hmm. who's, you know, who's uh, still capable of providing governments, and then, you know, and then start mm -hmm. the, the, their support. So when we start thinking about the medium term and the long term response, what do you think is uh, your organization's role will be and how long do you think you will be there? Um, I'm not sure on the duration. Uh, there was a, a couple meetings, uh, one in, in, in Canada already in terms of looking at donor nations to support Haiti. Mm -hmm. I think the government of Haiti has to figure out what do they want from a long term recovery aspect. Uh, this is a great opportunity in, in, a, in a very um, uh, serious, you know, in terms of an event, an, an, an unfortunate event with significant loss of life, but it does present the country of Haiti an opportunity to look for its future and say, where do we want to go as a country, both from a physical standpoint of how we want our country to be built and rebuilt, what infrastructure do we need, uh, what type of construction codes we fall under, mm -hmm. uh, but also it's, it's a time for social rebuilding. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as you look at um, the, the rebuilding of Haiti, uh, there has to be a, a, an element to say who are we and what, uh, from a Haitian st standpoint, um, and how do we want our country rebuilt? Mm -hmm. uh, again, not just physically, but socially. Uh, I, think, I think they have to look holistically. From the Corps of Engineers, uh, we do have technical expertise in certain areas. Debris management is one of those areas, and uh, we're working closely with the government of Haiti right now on developing a national debris plan to, one, uh, manage debris, but also you know, be good stewards of the environment. How can we reuse that debris to reduce landfill uh, locations and reduce the impacts on, on its environment, both in, on the island but uh, off-island? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's an area we'll work closer with them. Uh, public infrastructure, I think, is another area that we have um, that we'll work closer with the Haitian government. Again, uh, it depends on where they want to go. Uh, will the World Bank take a lead, the UN, who's had a presence there since about 94, 
Right, and so we're working with the international community, the government of, of America, is not just uh, the Corps of Engineers, to figure out what is the long-term plan, who has lead on it, how do we as a government, and then specifically the Corps of Engineers, support that plan? Uh, is it a World Bank plan, a UN plan, all in support of the Haitian government? But uh, I think that was, this will be a long-term recovery operation. So how do you overall measure the quality or evaluate the quality of the response? I think it comes to people. Uh, I mean, the, the job of, the, of, of any responder is to bring back a sense of normalcy to the population. And what is a sense of normalcy? Clothes on my back, food in my stomach, a roof over my head, uh, a sense of security that my family's taken care of, a sense of government that uh, the government's uh, governance that I'm being taken care of. Um, that's what to me, when I think of a sense of you know normalcy, what does normalcy mean to me? And so I think you have to measure it in terms of the people. Do they feel that their their normal life has returned? Do they have a sense of normalcy, or do they have a prolonged sense of this disaster is looming, it's not being, uh, we're not personally being taken care of, our needs are not being taken care of. And so our job is to, to reduce that time in which they're in that mm -hmm. uh, heightened state of, of, of fear and, uh, and concern to bring back that sense of normalcy. How do you calculate that time though? I mean, do, do, is, I mean, do you do any measurements of, you know, it took so many days to bring something? I, I think so there are. To, I mean, I'm just wondering, like yeah. the Corps of Engineers, I mean, are there any measurements or evaluation that you do? We, we do. I mean, there are some physical numbers that we try to achieve. First responders out the door in the next number of, of hours. Uh -huh. You know, the first roofs installed, uh, water distributed. First, we call them points of distribution uh, for water and ice and commodities. Uh, you know, how long does it take us to set those up? Um, how long does it take to get power? Uh, back in key facilities, everything from first responder facilities to shelters to medical facilities, nursing homes. Um, so we do measure ourselves in those metrics. Uh, we work that closely, with, uh, for example, in domestic ways. Um, excuse me. We work those closely with the states, and the, the, each of the states have their own emergency management system in place. We work closely with states and local governments, uh, along with, of course, FEMA, who we support. Uh, FEMA is the lead for, uh, for our domestic response. So we have those, those physical um, measurements, but again, I, I, it goes back to people. Uh, when, you're, when you're walking through a devastated area, when you're walking through Fargo, North Dakota, mm -hmm. am I proud to wear my Corps of Engineers shirt? Or am I hiding my logo because I think they're mad at me? I mean, that's, uh, you know, after Katrina, uh, would you walk down the streets of New Orleans with a, a FEMA shirt on uh, or with a Corps logo shirt on? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a measurement. I mean, how success, successful you are, and frankly, after Katrina, uh, I probably would have been uh, very nervous about wearing my Corps of Engineers shirt walking downtown uh, the French quarters. I think uh, a lot of the uh, both state and federal responders would, would, would say the same thing if they were being honest with themselves, mm -hmm. and, and the local responders. Uh, that, that is a case where, uh, as you look at all levels, individual preparation. We as individuals in this country have a responsibility to be prepared for incidents. Mm -hmm. And so from individual to a, a local county, to a state, to a federal, I think all of us have um, issues to bear that we have to fix, uh, just looking at post-Katrina. So I think, again, it's, we have physical measurements, but really it's, it's what do the people think? Uh, what, what Were their expectations met? Um, and, and, and do they have this sense of normalcy that I can continue my life, or is it a prolonged sense of worry and, and, and dread uh, that we're still in this uh, natural disaster, a man-made disaster? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you were to pinpoint a couple of things that went really well in Haiti, let's say, mm -hmm. what would you say? I, I think a well, couple, couple of things. One was communications. Uh, uh, across uh, the, the responding community. Mm -hmm. Communications with the government of Haiti, I think the Department of State, and other uh, national agencies from outside of the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. the French, Brazil, uh, and other countries, uh, their ability to quickly make contact with the, the government of Haiti to establish what are the needs, how do they want us to help, and then mobilizing inside of and specifically for the U.S. response, uh, the president quickly identified uh, USAID as lead, as a lead agent for this, and underneath USAID, OFTA, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, uh, then the relationship as that flows down from the national level to country level, the ambassador, and in this case, uh, our, from the military side, uh, our, our southern command is the, is, is the command that's responsible for this region of the world for the U.S. So that marriage between the ambassador and the southern command 
uh, in terms of taking, uh, working with the government and identifying where the needs are and what needs to be met. Uh, I think that, that went well. Uh, it, can it always be improved? Yes. Uh, communications is always tough. Uh, but I think that went well. I mean, we, we quickly knew what our missions would be, uh, specifically from the Corps of Engineers, uh, as we started to receive missions and, and uh, queries from the USID and how we could help. Uh, we had pre-positioned LNOs in USID. I have a, mm -hmm. a gentleman, Bruce Elliott, uh, uh, very experienced in, in both the military, he's a retired colonel, but also has many years of experience in strate strategic planning and, and networking. Uh, uh, he's a people person, and so he's my liaison officer at USAID. Mm -hmm. um, we just put him there about a year ago, but he, in that short 12 months, he's made the relationships and the networks so that when, when this happened, we had a, a natural conduit into USAID mm -hmm. um, to, to begin to understand where they needed help, USAID, from us and where we could help. And so I think that's a success. I mean, it, it wasn't uh, we, we, uh, a bit of luck maybe that we had in position 12 months ago, but we're working exactly. hard, um, you know, across from the Corps perspective, uh, putting liaison officers, uh, posting them in, in the, those areas that we think we can provide support. We have them in FEMA, a full-time person at FEMA, USAID, Department of State, mm -hmm. uh, OSD, and then we have them throughout the, the world working with all the different combatant commanders mm -hmm. uh, so that when these events happen, uh, again, you make a friend before you need a friend. Uh, these people live and work every day in these offices. They, they share the same office space, the same water coolers, the same dining facilities, and uh, they have social gatherings at night, so uh, they know each other. And so I think that was a, a plus for us. That we, we were positioned well with relationships and networks to help uh, just to make sure everyone's aware of where, where we can help uh, and, and what we could do to facilitate uh, the response to Haiti. So let's talk a little bit uh, briefly on the long-term long -term development and long-term mm -hmm. events. And I think you've mentioned that you're doing uh, particularly these kind of things in Africa. Yes, ma'am. In water safety and availability, mm -hmm. I suppose. Could you uh, tell a little bit about the challenges, the different challenges that are faced by these kind of long-term developmentally? Well, the biggest challenge is, uh, I don't think it's just in America, I think worldwide, uh, we are fairly focused at the near term uh, as a population. It's not that uh, we, we don't think long term, but we want immediate results. You want to be able to invest and have immediate results from that investment uh, in terms of long term, uh, either from a long term reconstruction effort post an event or just uh, long-term planning uh, the, the, and preparing so that when an event happens uh, you can mitigate as quickly as possible. I, I think that's the biggest challenge. People want immediate results, they want to see the investment and they want to see the results of the investment. So from a U.S. standpoint uh, that, that's time and dollars. Mm -hmm. Two of the most precious uh, things that we have right now is to, in terms of how much time, personal time, uh, how much uh, human capital are we willing to allocate toward a long-term event uh, and how much fiscal dollars are we willing to put against that to, to, to achieve a, an end state. Uh, we're lucky in that I think we've had a longer term view. I think we've, we've learned not only as our nation, but all nations and all responders have learned that uh, if your sole mitigation uh, to an event is a fast response, then you're probably you're behind before the event happens. I mean, it, it, if all you are betting on is that I will respond quickly and professionally, and that's how I'll mitigate uh, uh, an event, uh, we've missed a mark. And so I think we've learned that to mitigate properly, you have to have planning ahead of time. You have to have a, a very, very dyna dynamic and quick response, but you also need long-term recovery. Mm -hmm. So I think we understand now that there are, I'll say, three phases of the operation, but you have to plan, you have to respond quickly, but then you have to recover long-term. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think, um, I think that's an area is that, that short-term mentality that we have to get over. I think we have gotten it over in, in a lot of cases. I think Africa is a great example. We're doing, we've been working in Africa for years now in terms of water surety and water resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you, you know, look across the uh, different magazines and academia and, and, and institutions, there's lots of discussions on where, where, what are the next wars what, and what will be fought over. One of the topics, food and water, energy. And so I think we have to look long term in those areas. I think Africa is a great example of working with the, uh, the uh, Millennium Corporation, uh, mm -hmm. doing long term water resilience and water surety programs.
how can we educate the public and the donors and the governments uh, to invest in these kind of more long term? Like, mm -hmm. what should be the message, or what? How should you be measured, so that actually the measurement includes the long term efforts? Yeah. That's a good question. You said no hard questions. Today. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, gosh, Amadi, uh, that, that's a tough one. It it is. Uh, I, th I think it's just a recognition that it, that the world is 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 one large community, uh, in that we, we have many different nations, uh, but we all have a responsibility to each other, and understanding that the responsibility sometimes forces you to go outside your your borders, um, and as lead nations, uh, those who are postured both uh, with uh, technical skills uh, like America has, mm -hmm. uh, monetary. Uh, capabilities like America has, but also global reach that America has. We, you have to be willing to, to, to accept that responsibility and, and to execute it. Mm -hmm. it. But it is a tough one. I, mean, it's, I, I don't know if, if there's one thing you can do. I think you know, the global communications uh, and the global networking amongst uh, young college students. I mean, you look at Georgia Tech, and, and uh, this morning we heard about the many different uh, networks that Georgia Tech has throughout different countries. I think those kind of things help when you start interacting at that level, at the collegiate level mm -hmm. and academia, but also in our young citizens. So they come up with a sense of, you still have a national sense. I mean, we're, we're, we're Americans, uh, but we also have a sense that we have a peace and a place to, to, to play in this world. Uh, I think that helps. But there is always a friction there uh, between national needs and international needs. Mm -hmm. This kind of emergency response, disasters, mm -hmm. and, and so on, is, is a challenging field to be in. Why, right. why do you do it personally? Uh, I, th I think part of it's um, personal satisfaction. Um, I enjoy the military. I love what I do. Uh, and I think uh, some people don't realize just how many humanitarian assets or how, how many humanitarian efforts that the military executes. Mm -hmm. uh, the military is about people. We're a people organization. Our job is to, to, to defend the, the peoples of America. Uh, but in that endeavor, we have the great opportunity to work with other nations. So I remember some of my first ones, uh, the Ecuadorian uh, earthquake of 1986, I think was my first humanitarian response, 86 or 87, mm -hmm. uh, the earth, earthquake in Ecuador. Uh, but as we live and work with other countries, I lived in, in Germany for six years, uh, I had a great opportunity to work in Southeast Europe, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, uh, Fyrom, uh, Kosovo. Uh, and, and worked in, working to, to rebuild orf orphanages, schools, ambulantes, um, bridges, roads. Uh, you, you just get this sense of uh, completeness that, uh, that you're giving back something.